so welcome everyone to the uh, Curtis Gen Genomes Diversity and Evolution Seminar Series. Um, for those of you who've been on this before, uh, this was a kind of ad hoc private seminar series that we had been testing out for a few weeks and it, it's been going really well. So we decided to merge it uh, and bring it to the uh, uh, ICEP. Um, and ICEP is now sponsoring this meeting. Uh, and uh, we're going to be, uh, you all saw the sign up sheet, uh, hopefully um, it's being advertised. Um, and so uh, all Protus lovers are welcome to join. Uh, we'll be getting a more official kind of uh, a way of uh, getting participants um, uh, signed up and some way of vetting uh, other uh, uh, applicants if we get overwhelmed with too many people who want to present. Um, so anyway, welcome to everybody uh, uh, all over the world. And uh, I don't want to take up too much time um, because uh, we have an, a good lineup of speakers. Uh, we have a Jun Jorlström Hultqvist, uh, who's a researcher in Uppsala University, uh, someone who I have been working with for many uh, years. And, uh, and then after that, we have Iker Irisari, uh, and he will be speaking on the origin of uh, primary plastids. So um, without further ado, uh, I think I'm going to hand this over to Yoon, who uh, will be telling us about symbiosis in anaramoeba. So Yoon, do you have... Uh, I, you should have the ability to show your slides now, I think. Uh, yes, thanks. Is it showing? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I want to thank Isaac for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, so, as Andrew said, my name is Jon Jarlstebulkvist, uh, and I recently returned to Sweden to work at Uppsala University. And uh, today I'm gonna speak about uh, postdoc work I did in Andrew's lab, uh, working on symbiosis in anaerobia. Uh, and uh, most of our knowledge we have today about anaerobic protists uh, is based on studies mainly from human parasites, uh, such as Jardia, Entamoeba, and Trichomonas. And um, many of these have significantly reduced metabolic capacity, so it kind of limits our knowledge about real life systems. Um, and many uh, parasites uh, are not representative to what you can find in natural environments, such as sediments uh, and uh, yeah, sediments in lakes and, and ocean, for example. Uh, one common theme uh, among free living protists uh, is uh, the um, ability to strike up partnerships with various uh, other microbes, uh, such as archaea or um, bacteria. And one common theme that we often uh, see is that these bacteria or archaea are often closely associated with mitochondrial relic organelles such as hydrogenosomes. Um, and uh, these uh, endo or ectosymbionts often sit in a very close, close physical proximity to the hydrogenosomes. Um, and the currency in these interactions uh, often appear to be hydrogen. So uh, the aptly named hydrogenosomes uh, produce ATP for the host organism. Um, and uh, then uh, the by substrate phosphorylation and the end products of this substrate phosphorylation, such as hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and acetate, can be passed on to a symbiont, uh, as shown here, uh, for example, methanogenic archaea. And to the left, you can see a hydrogenosome with uh, methanogenic archaea very tightly pressed up to them. Um, so anaerobia uh, is uh, a newly described uh, lineage of organisms that were uh, 
first isolated and described in the lab of Ivan Shepishka uh, by Peter Tabowski and Tomasz Panek. Uh, these organisms were sampled from shallow marine uh, sediments uh, across the world. And they were able to establish mono eukaryotic semicultures uh, of uh, two species and a couple of isolates of one species. Um, and these are uh, amoebo flagellates, uh, but the amoeboid for, or the flagellate form has only been observed with two species and it has rarely been seen in culture. Um, so, what's interesting about an amoeba uh, is if you take the organism and you stain it with a tubulin antibody, you see this very nice radiating tubulin network. Uh, and if you also stain the DNA, you can see a prominent nucleus, but you can also see a mass of other uh, organisms that stain. Uh, if I take away the tubulin stain, you see it more clearly. Um, and these looks like they are symbiont organisms. And if you take these cells uh, and you do transmission electron microscopy, uh, you can see that uh, indeed these are microorganisms that sit very, very closely associated to mitochondrial relic organelles in the amoeba. And it seems like these uh, organisms are not free in the cytoplasm, but they are surrounded by a membrane. Uh, so possibly they are in a vacuole uh, that might be host derived. Um, and at this time, these uh, prokaryotes uh, were unidentified. So we didn't know what these organisms were, even what class or what, uh, yeah, what bigger group of organisms they belong to. Um, so, uh, there's been a big collaborative project on Aramiba uh, running out of the Shepichka and the Roger Labs uh, by current and past members uh, of the labs. Um, so, we've been interested in figuring out Aramiba, where it belongs taxonomically, and also uh, being interested in the symbiosis that it seems to uh, have. So, first of all, we were interested in, in learning what an amoeba actually is. Um, so, what organism are they? Um, and uh, Martin Kulisko and Laura M uh, performed a phylogenetic analysis, uh, multi gene phylogeny, uh, and they were able to place an amoeba uh, using two different species, two species of an amoeba. Um, and it turns out that an amoeba are metamonas and end up being a sister lineage to parabasilids. So with this in mind, uh, we were also interested in trying to figure out what their MROs are doing. So uh, this uh, task uh, was performed by Courtney Stairs uh, and she was able to uh, find out that an amoeba encodes proteins that typically are found uh, in hydrogenosome bearing organisms. Uh, so likely we have uh, then the foundations for a syntropy situation. But what we didn't know uh, was who the endosymbionts were. Um, and this is where I was drafted into the project. Um, so we started doing large scale cultivation of uh, amoebas that we received from the Shepichka lab. Uh, and we devised a protocol to enrich for amoebas and to try to uh, sequence uh, or use 16S sequencing to try figure, uh, figuring out that taxonomy of the prokaryotes in the amoebas. Uh, so we did this by uh, selectively enriching for the cells using uh, rinsing them and then doing a cold shock to selectively, selectively dislodge the amoebas. Um, this analysis proved to be very efficient in separating uh, the supernatant organisms from the anamoeba cells. Uh, and we were able to see that uh, symbionts, uh, the, the likely enriched, the enriched cells, which are the likely symbionts, seem to belong to the Salpobacteraceae. Uh, this also turned out to be present in another uh, isolate we have called Schooner. Uh, and in another species, we also detected enrichment for the Salpobacteraceae symbionts. Um, our next step was to try to get genome sequences done for the host organisms as well as the symbionts. So we devised, uh, we took our uh, enrichment protocol uh, to generate cell material uh, and we did uh, DNA extraction and nano for sequencing. Um, I will not describe this in detail, uh, but 
feel free to ask me after the presentation if you're interested in the details of how you do this uh, in a practical fashion. Um, so in total, we generated three genomes um, from two different species of Anamoeba, um, from <laughs> Anamoeba ignava, uh, strain b man and from Anamoeba flamyloides, Busselton and Schooner. Um, the genome sizes are quite different, in, uh, different uh, and turns out they have relatively GC4 genomes. So Anamoeba ignava b man is very, very GC4. Um, for example. Uh, I will not talk today so much about the host genomes and I will focus more on the symbiont genomes. Um, so along with the uh, host genomes, we also uh, obtained a number of circularized assemblies which uh, contain highly uh, covered uh, the sulfobacteraceae genomes. Um, we took these genomes and we performed uh, a phylogenomic analysis and with this, we could see that uh, these organisms seem to belong to the, the sulfobacter genus, um, so which max, matches very well with them being uh, the sulfobacteraceae by uh, 16S analysis. Um, we took out the 16S gene and, and designed the uh, fish probes to confirm that this was indeed the right organisms. And we got a very clear signal uh, in Busselton and Schooner. Um, that confirmed that these cells are indeed uh, um, indeed matches the genomes that we have sequenced. Uh, next, uh, we looked a bit more closely at the genomes we had obtained for endosymbionts. Uh, it turns out that the, these genomes are, we obtained two closed circular genomes and for Schooner, uh, the genome is almost closed. Uh, it has one major contig and then it has 25 smaller or shorter contigs. Um, in either case, it turns out that these genomes are gene rich and large. Um, so they encode similar amount of genes as a free living uh, isolate shown on the right. Um, what is interesting though is that especially the symbiont genomes from uh, Anamoeba flamyloides show uh, an expansion of IS elements, um, which is uh, seen often in genomes which are undergoing uh, restriction uh, in that they can all of a sudden tolerate insertion of IS elements. Uh, and in like in, in um, along with this we also saw, saw an elevated or a high number of, of pseudogenes um, in, in those genomes as well. Uh, and uh, one thing that was interesting uh, when it comes to the flamyloides and the or symbiont genomes uh, is that they, they turn out to be very, very closely related. Uh, in synthetic, synthetic blocks, they are 99.6% identical, but they show extensive rearrangements. Uh, and you can see uh, on the outside of this, of this ring here, uh, each of these red ticks represent an IS element in each genome. Uh, and it looks like uh, some of the IS elements uh, were inserted in a common ancestor, but many are novel and have new insertion sites. Uh, so these genomes uh, have about 14% of their gene space present as pseudogenes. And uh, we see pseudogenization in flagellar operons, pilus assembly genes, uh, sensor genes uh, to look at, to be able to sample the extracellular milieu, uh, another multi-copy gene families also seem to be affected by uh, pseudogenization. Uh, but what about the metabolism? Uh, the uh, we have proposed a syntrophic interaction uh, that might be happening between uh, uh, anamoeba, uh, the anamoeba organism and uh, the sulfobacter symbionts. Uh, and in this case, it seems like it's possible that the sulfobacter would be able to use hydrogen uh, from the host hydrogenosomes and uh, potentially also utilize uh, acetate um, in the wood Jungdahl pathway. Um, we're not quite sure about uh, if there are other players in, in this uh, syntrophy, like amino acid exchange or uptake of other short chain fatty acids, which certainly would be possible. Um, one problem or one concern that we had about proposing this is um, Sulfate reduction demands ready access to sulfate. Um, and if the cells are indeed endosymbionts, this might be a problem. 
Um, but you do remember that these cells were found inside vacuoles. And so what about the access to these vacuoles of sulfate? So we devised an experiment where we tried to, to at, at least investigate this uh, a little bit. Uh, so we took the cells and uh, we used uh, wheat germ agglutinin, which is a lectin that labels N-acetyl D-glucosamine, uh, which is present in the outer membrane uh, in some bacterial species. Uh, indeed, uh, DJ uh, is able to decorate uh, Basilton II symbionts um, when the cells are alive. Uh, so this is during a short 10 minute incubation. Uh, and this staining pattern is similar to free, free living bacteria. So this indicates uh, to us that there is indeed a very ready access of the extracellular milieu to the inside of the cell, either via direct access, uh, maybe via channels from the surface, or perhaps via extensive, very rapid vesicle transport or exchange. Um, we did also an experiment to try to see if we could see any of these supposed channels that could be on from the outside uh, by doing uh, SEM. Um, I did this in collaboration with Gordon Lax, uh, a former member of the Simpson lab. Um, uh, we were able to spot uh, what looked like small invaginations uh, on the surface of some cells, but we have no idea how deep these channels are, or this is from a single experiment, so this needs to be repeated uh, to be able to learn more about uh, the situation. So, in summary, um, we were able to find out that Anamoeba, uh, at least Anamoeba ignava and Anamoeba flamyloides, seems to carry the Sulfobacter symbionts. Uh, that are tightly associated with their hydrogenosomes, even though they are separated by or found inside a vacuum. Um, we were not able to find out if they sit in deep pits, uh, so if they are like endosymbionts or ectosymbionts that just are very deep inside of the kind of cell body. Um, we suspect that hydrogen is the main driver of this, but um, it's possible that there are other metabolites exchanged as well. Maybe there is a sulfide cycle, for example. Um, and we're interested to learn in the future with the, in that we have the host genome as well to try to understand if there are effectors or other recognition mechanisms uh, between the host and the symbiont. Um, and are these symbionts stable over time and can they be replaced and how is this influencing the host? So maybe looking at horizontal gene transfers uh, to investigate if there has been any previous interactions with them. Uh, and we have also been trying to, our hands at developing some genetic techniques to try to investigate this also on the lab bench. Uh, so Tang Tang Chang, um, a member of the, visiting member of the Roger lab, um, was able to obtain some early transfection results uh, on, in an amoeba flamyloides just before uh, the present situation with the the COVID-19 outbreak happened. So hopefully we're able to visit this in the future and develop it further. Uh, we're also interested to try to figure out, because we have seen some examples where we can have heterogeneous populations. Um, so in some cells, there seem to be other delta proteobacteria and potentially also archobacter strains that are labeled. Um, so maybe there are different lineages of these cells also. Uh, and it's not only the sulfobacter, which is a possible symbol. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank the people of the Roger Lab uh, and other people that have collaborated in this uh, big project, uh, people in the Simpson Lab as well at Dalhousie, uh, and a slew of different funders as well. So I will now take any questions. OK, thanks, Yun. Um, so uh, I think we don't have too many people, so we can probably uh, just accommodate the, if people want to speak up and uh, say their name uh, and then ask a question, please go ahead. This is Fred Spiegel. Are you able to uh, cure the amoebae of their endosymbionts? 
And if, if so, can you reinfect them? We haven't been able to do it so far. Um, I was trying uh, using uh, some uh, molybdate to try to kill the symbionts, um, but I wasn't able to. Um, and I've tried some preliminary experiments using antibiotics, but, but I wasn't able to cure them. Uh, like both the symbiont and the, and, the, and the host died in those experiments, but uh, I haven't investigated it very thoroughly. So, so I haven't been able to do any reinfection experiments, unfortunately. Uh, John, uh, this is Puri Lopez uh, from France. And I ask, I, I have a question about this Arcobacter that you mentioned, because mm -hmm. these are epsilon proteobacteria that might be uh, uh, so oxidizing uh, sulfur and then closing the uh, sulfur cycle. Have you tried to look about that in more detail or? Which, yeah. what, which ones did you say? Sorry, I didn't hear. Quite you just mentioned at the end that the, in, in some of these uh, anaera amoeba, you find also um, uh, Arcobacter. Yes. And this, these bacteria, these are epsilon uh, proteobacteria that usually are sulf uh, sulfur oxidizers. So they would actually co complete the sulfur cycle uh, together in complementarity with the delta proteobacteria. Have you looked into that or? Uh, I haven't looked into it very carefully. Um, I mean, we know that they are there. We also know that they are the sulfovibrio. There are a number of different organisms. Yeah, but the sulfovibrio would do the same thing as the sulfate producers, whereas Arcobacter is, is doing exactly the opposite. So you would mm -hmm. have, you will close a, a sulfur cycle. So these Arcobacter are very common. Actually, epibionts or epicymbionts in many uh, deep sea vent fauna or something like, like that, and they detoxify H2S. Uh, so they oxidize that uh, to, to uh, they can oxidize sulfide or sulfur to sulfate, so that uh, that would complete a cycle for sulfate reducers then to close it. So I would expect that kind of complementarity there, metabolic complementarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see, we see them for sure. That would be interesting to look at that a bit further, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for you? Do we have time for one more? Yeah, yep. I would have one. Uh, I want to ask you something related to pseudogenes because you have a really high number of pseudogenes and you yes. also sequence using nanopore. I assume you polish the genome with Illumina, but this is my observation that sometimes in nanopore assembled genomes, I get by far more pseudogenes than in other type of assemblies. So my question is, did you try to confirm some of these pseudogenes by some PCR or something, just to be sure that it's not a, an assembly artifact? Um. We haven't done that yet, but we sh yeah, we can do that. That uh, would be a good idea. Uh, these are hybrid. I didn't show all the details about assembly, but these are hybrid genome assemblies. So uh, using both the short and the long reads. Uh, so we're using the assembly <laughs> unicycler. So I would expect yeah, them to exactly. be relatively accurate, but it's well worth checking nonetheless. Exactly. I also use unicycler and I observe sometimes as I told you, really, really high number of pseudogenes, although I do not expect that because they are normal bacteria, not, uh, not to say, not symbionts, uh, so I don't expect them to be pseudogenized. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's right, I should should do some work. Like, all, all the pseudogenization doesn't come necessarily from indels, it's also from, like, rearrangements and, like, it, like bona fide insertions of ice elements and so on. Um, but it, it's, of course, it's a mixture of both. Yeah, thanks. We have quite, uh, time for another couple of questions. Anyone? Yeah, has? So, I, so can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, have you guys done uh, 
serial TEM to try to follow one of those channels all the way down um, to see whether it ends up sort of containing a bacteria in a cul-de-sac or? We haven't done it yet. We would love to do that if there's someone who would collaborate on doing that. Uh, so, but unfortunately we haven't been able to go down that uh, route yet. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, great, thanks. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> this relates to Puri's question. Um, in if Archibacter is the uh, completing the sulfur cycle, do we know what Archibacter uses? What its range of electron acceptors are? Like, what should we expect the electron acceptor to be? Like, do we imagine that working on very small amounts of oxygen, or could it be pulling something else? Is this a question to me? Uh, yeah, I guess it's a really bad way of asking this question because it's really. I, I think that um, yeah, they, they certainly can use oxygen, but maybe they can also use nitrate or other uh, electron acceptors. Uh, it is very very commonly found in places where you don't have a lot of oxygen, like uh, very nearby uh, deep sea vents in environments that are uh, oxygen poor. So. Being, being aerobic, but uh, and perhaps using also other uh, electron acceptors such as nitrate or something like that. But I don't know in this particular case, but maybe you have some genomes there because I don't know, depending on the strains, you may have to get some assembly of, of this organism and then look for the gene. I don't know. I'm yeah, not a I mean, specialist. I've yeah. seen the archobacters in there. We haven't pursued them very much so far, but they're certainly represented and we can easily obtain their well, good assemblies of them, I think. Maybe get a look into them because it sounds like it's uh, the perfect perfect uh, metabolic match to the delta proteobacteria there. Mm -hmm. yeah. good idea. I guess I was sort of wondering if there might be some probably fruitlessly, but if there might be some sort of easy experiment where you uh, supply uh, the desired electron acceptor and see if you get uh, like hugely increased yields of the anaeromoeba or something like that. It's, yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think that, thank you very much, uh, Yoon. We can, uh, I'll clap uh, either virtually or in reality. I, uh, Inyaki was much better at coordinating a group clapping noise. So one, two, three, clap.